this is a podcast of the main features of the workshop that we conducted together in week one of Introduction to Educational Settings, TCHE 2405. Schools are really familiar places. Most of you have spent at least 12 years in one. Some people think that makes them an expert in schools and schooling, but does it? Being a student or a parent of students, of some, as some of you may be, gives us a particular perspective about schools as places where education takes place. In this course, we want to start to challenge your perspectives about those spaces where education takes place, or might we think of where schooling occurs, to provide you with moments of discomfort as we ask you to question your beliefs, be they explicit or tacit, and to explore other possibilities. So how will we do this? Introducing ideas. In the time that we have together, it's not possible to explore many concepts in any great depth. Instead, we'll use our time together to introduce you to ideas, to theories, to ways of seeing and thinking about where education takes place and what things act to shape that and to shape you. As master's level students, we expect you to use your own time to explore these ideas further by engaging with the set readings, by engaging with additional references that might appear in the lecture component of our time together, and to go beyond what we ask you to read and find other articles, books, YouTube videos, and so on that relate to our topics. This course is called Introduction to Education Settings, and it will introduce you to education settings. But in the process, one of the objectives that we have is to get you to think about who you are as a person and as a teacher, to get you thinking about issues of identity, your identity as a teacher. What kind of a teacher do you want to be? Why? What beliefs do you have about what purpose schools serve, about the role of schools and about the role of the teacher? What other factors are at play that impact on those spaces where education takes place? Those different settings, some of which are schools but not all, and what factors impact on you as a teacher? The structure of this course is perhaps a little different from what you may have been used to um, for a university subject, but it is typical of the direction universities are taking. The first four weeks you will be on campus in a two-hour face-to-face workshop. However, before each workshop, there will be an online lecture to view with occasionally some other resources or videos to view. There will also be readings we set together with a brief reflective activity that is designed to ask you to think. The face-to-face -face tutorials are designed around those pre-workshop tasks. So to get the most out of those face-to-face -face tutorials, we ask that you come to your tutorials prepared with those tasks completed. In the online lectures, we talk at you. But in your tutorials, we expect to be talking with you. In fact, we want you to do most of the talking. That's why it's important that you engage with the pre-workshop tasks before each tutorial and come prepared to discuss your ideas, your expectations, your questions, your concerns, your doubts and your anxieties with each other and with your tutor. After Easter, after the first four weeks on campus, you'll be spending every Thursday for five weeks in schools on your first professional experience placement. During that time, there will also be some online lectures and workshop activities that we expect you to engage in. But instead of the face-to-face -face tutorials, we are expecting that you will engage in some online professional conversations with your tutors and with each other to share the experiences that you are experiencing. Placement in the way we've structured this program can be a lonely experience. You may in fact be the only RMIT student at a particular school or um, the only pre-service teacher at a school and it's really helpful in those situations to have somebody else to turn to. So 
By the time you go out on placement, we will have established some online discussion spaces for you to engage in. And when you're on placement, you see your classroom, your school, your mentor teacher. Whilst that is an incredibly rich and rewarding learning experience, by reflecting collaboratively with your peers and with your tutor, the learning experience about what schools are, what the point of schools is, and what your role as a teacher is within that space, is enriched by you sharing your respective experiences with each other. So that's an expectation that we have that you will do that. During your time in schools, you'll be expected to um, attend school between approximately 8.30 and 5.30 every day. That will be um, nego something that you will negotiate with your teacher mentor, but there are rough expectations as to um, your attendance at school on those days. During the day, you'll be undertaking some observations or classroom audits that we might ask you to do, but you might also like to observe other aspects of the classroom that we're not asking you to observe, and that's fine. The purpose of this placement is for you to get a feel for what a teacher does, to look at the classroom through the eyes of a teacher, not through the eyes of a learner. You'll also be getting to practice your teaching. Whilst this round, um, the expectations are fairly minimal, for example, we would expect you to be working with individual students or with small groups of students, um, potentially delivering lessons uh, or learning activities that your mentor teacher has developed, but that's a minimum expectation. Every pre-service teacher will have a different experience because they'll have a different classroom with different children, a different mentor in a different school. So the dynamics of those are all uh, unique to you. Our advice is that you do as much as you feel comfortable doing in negotiation with your mentor. If you feel confident to teach a lesson and your mentor is supportive of that, that's fine. But you don't have to if you are uncomfortable doing that. Having said that, as a teacher, it's always good to challenge yourself. So remember, remember, remember that. We'll talk more about the placement experience as we get closer to it and as these following four weeks unfold. In the week following your placement, following the end of your placement, there will be one more face-to-face -face tutorial. That tutorial has been designed to help you make sense of your recent placement experience and to put a little holding mark there and help you think about your goals for your next placement experience next semester. Why do we have schools? When I've asked students this question in the past, I get a range of responses. Some suggest we have schools so that young people can be prepared for life, particularly for the world of employment. Some argue that schools help young people make a better life for themselves, that schools can help level the playing field and make society a little bit more equal. Others have talked about the need for schools to foster creativity and innovation, to encourage young people to explore their curiosity and their interests and to nurture their desire to learn and to develop. develop. This might be a cynical question, but do we really need a school to do this? Don't children come pre-packaged with innovation, creativity and curiosity when they're particularly young? My experience um, would suggest, or my observations would suggest that as children get older, schools tend to beat that creativity and innovation out of them. My cynicism about this is shared by Sir Ken Robinson, who for years has made a very healthy living out of talking about and writing about how schools are killing creativity. I highly recommend that you view his TED Talk um, from 2007 now. There's a link to this in the Going Further section of the Session 1 folder on the course website. So a little aside, um, all of these aims are rather wonderful aims. But the purpose of the exercise I've asked you to do uh, as one of your pre-workshop tasks is to make you aware that the purpose of schools is a highly contested arena. Different people argue for different aims. 
So, I shall ask the question again, why do we have schools? Many of the answers form in, fall into one of a number of categories. Some argue that we have schools so that we can quite easily and readily reproduce the, social, the society that we currently have. Population tends to be regulated through education. It's a way of transfer, transferring those social norms. The curriculum that we, we teach reinforces desired values and traditions and social norms. And whilst these might be seen as uh, desirable or seen as a good, things like respect um, around equity, around social justice, um, education in Australia has act, or has tended to act to reproduce the hegemonic norms of white, western, middle-class populations. So some are fairly critical of this um, role that schools play. As some of you may also argue, and certainly some of my students in the past have argued, schools provide an opportunity for all students to succeed regardless of their background or of their context, so it helps with social mobility, about doing better than the previous generation. Economic prosperity is another function that schools are argued to, uh, to provide. Schools provide our young people with the 21st century skills that accommodate the demands of a global economy, an economy that is increasingly reliant on digital technology skills, on collaboration, on creativity and innovation and problem solving. Schools are also seen as places that help to overcome the inequities in our society, that help us to create a more just and more equal society. I suspect that there are probably some elements of our society who would argue that schools, in fact, do the opposite. And this is linked very much to the first point around social reproduction. Another uh, reason that we have schools is related to the um, intrinsic benefits of learning. Learning in itself can be the end rather than the means to one of these other ends. So schools are places where we can get where we can derive pleasure and benefit from the processes of learning. But is the purpose of school any single one of these things, or is it all of these things? Are some of these purposes of schooling more important to you than others? Your position on the reason that we have schools is dependent upon your philosophical underpinnings your beliefs about why schools exist. So you have to examine what those beliefs are. Your beliefs shape who you are as a teacher, the kind of teacher that you will be. During your time at university, we want to challenge your thinking and ask you to know and to be able to articulate what those beliefs are and then to make informed choices about how these beliefs are reflected in your teaching practice. It's worth uh, looking at the current Declaration on Educational Goals for Young Australians. This is a document that is revisited periodically by the respective Ministers for Education in States and Territories and the Commonwealth. And the Melbourne Declaration on Educational Goals for Young Australia is the current declaration that we are still using some years later. And within this, uh, this document are uh, two rather key goals. Australian schooling promotes equity and excellence. This, this goal um, relates to a range of expectations that schools will provide students with schooling that is free from discrimination, that builds on local cultural knowledge, that acknowledges and works with Indigenous students and um, local communities. It also reduces, is, this goal is also um, that equity and social justice goal that we were talking about earlier, that is uh, socioeconomic disadvantage ceases to be a determinant of educational outcomes. Um, schooling contributes to a socially cohesive society that is respectful of cultural, social and religious diversity. Schools are also supposed to support a culture of excellence 
um, providing challenging and stimulating learning experiences and opportunities and promote personalised learning that um, addresses the individual needs and gifts and talents of each student. Goal two, that all young Australians become successful learners, confident and creative individuals and active informed citizens, uh, is a little bit self-explanatory, but talks about a range of core skills, literacy, numeracy, creative and productive users of technology, particularly uh, information and communications technology, promotes deep and logical thinking, um, higher order thinking, resourceful students, uh, problem solvers, all those sorts of 21st century skills. But it's also about creating confident and creative individuals um, where young people are encouraged to embrace opportunities and make rational, informed decisions about their own lives. Hmm, interesting one for a 15-year-old. Have a sense of optimism about their lives and their future, a sense of self-worth, managing their emotional, mental and physical well-being. But also that young people become active and informed citizens, that they appreciate our diversity uh, in this country and understand and acknowledge the value of, of Indigenous cultures, um, committed to our values of democracy, equity and justice. So you can see here that, as I was talking earlier, some of these goals are about reproducing those elements of society that we believe are those good things that should be reproduced. So I, um, I urge you to go and look at the PDF. I've given you the URL there. And there's a link to it in the course website. Schools are inherently political spaces. Government policy, such as that Melbourne Declaration on the Goals for Young People, special initiatives like the Rudd Government's Digital Education Revolution, decisions around funding derived from the Gonski Report, the recent or current seemingly endless review of the Australian curriculum are clearly political acts, but there are politics at all levels of a school, from the top-down policies that are grounded in federal politics to the school-level policies, uniforms or no uniforms, performance reviews, standardised testing, etc., and to activ activities that take place in your own classroom. Schools are complex places. As Udell states, they are assemblages of different components – human, material, personal, organisational, that cut across each other. How all the elements that make up a particular school need to be understood and observed in order to unpack the complexities and to understand how it works. So when you are in schools in the second part of semester, look for the politics. Look at the various aspects of that particular assemblage of things and how they all come together. Look at the politics that shape that particular assemblage and ask yourself, what are your politics? Schools and education is always a hot topic in the press. The media is constantly focused on stories about education, particularly what happens in schools. Why is that? I think it's because everybody thinks they're an expert, as we've already discussed, so everyone has a view. Politicians, parents, industry and commerce are all stakeholders in schools and schooling and all have views about what schools should do. It also seems that no matter what schools do, everyone's a critic. Schools are positioned as a problem that needs fixing. One good example is Australia's relative standing in international education league tables. They always bring out cries that we don't have enough funding. Schools need to have more autonomy and operate more like a business. Teachers aren't good enough. Teacher education isn't producing the right sort of teachers. And so it goes. Student data also suggests that there may be some problems. Levels of student engagement in schools are low and falling. High proportions of students lose motivation from as early as grade four and five. They feel a sense of hopelessness and a lack of confidence. They find school mostly irrelevant. These are troubling messages indeed. So how, as a teacher, do you respond? How do schools respond? How you respond and how school respond. schools respond depends upon what collectively and individually people in those schools believe the aim of education is and what the purpose of schooling is. Also, it depends upon what they see their values as. And we talked about values in our interactive session. 
And some of the interesting things from my group about values was that the students felt that the schools that they attended valued discipline, respect, academic achievement, uh, sports, um, conformity. Interestingly, when I asked them what they valued, it was quite a different picture. The group, students in my group valued creativity and innovation, a sense of wonder and curiosity, uh, relationships, all those sort of warmer and fuzzier things. What do you value and how will that shape you as a teacher? I wanted to be a little provocative with this. Are schools the only place we learn? I don't think they are. We learn from our parents, we learn from each other, we learn these days off the internet. Do we really need schools? Are teachers the only ones who can teach? I don't think so either. As I said, we learn from our parents. Our parents are our first teachers. People often learn from religious leaders. We learn from each other. We learn from observing what goes on in the world. We learn from television, we learn from the media, and we learn more from the internet. Do we actually need teachers? Do digital technologies render our current forms of school obsolete? Interestingly enough, we can go online to the Khan Academy and learn everything we need to learn about maths. Not a teacher involved, at least not in a classroom. I guess these are ideas that are current in a lot of the literature around education and may in fact render your job in the long term irrelevant or maybe not. Let's have a look at what some other people think about the future scenarios for schools. In 2001, the OECD developed a series of clusters of scenarios for what might happen into the future with schools. The first of these clusters really revolved around maintaining the status quo, not changing anything, more of the same. Very interestingly, Dan Lorty observed back in 2002 that education does not change at a rapid pace. The major structures in public education are much the same today as 30 years ago. One might even argue they're much the same as a couple of hundred years ago, but one might be a little cynical about that. Pressure for inertia is strong within the schooling sector. The structures that Lorty refers to here are not just the physical spaces of school, which are fairly much the same as 30 years ago in most cases, in some cases, not just the buildings, the playgrounds, the corridors, but the social and cultural structures of schools, the hierarchical roles that people assume, the organisation of time, that's the timetable, the curriculum and so on. The pressure for this inertia comes from a number of stakeholders. It comes from parents who may find it difficult to imagine alternatives to their own experiences comes from politicians who might share the same, who hark back to the days of Shakespeare and, and Dickens as the canons of English literature and the idea of studying film as text is abhorrent to them. Or to those who believe that history should be about British history and Australian history starts with the uh, white settlement. But pressure, inertia, pressure for inertia within schools also remains strong from, from teachers and school leaders who resist anything but the most minor shifts in their role. Change in schools is difficult to generate. The second set of scenarios comes under the term reschooling, where we try to reinvent schools within fairly similar structures. A stronger culture of experimentation, inquiry learning, so a different set of pedagogies might emerge under these scenarios that are more innovative. Um, the other feature of these scenarios is a much stronger connection with community to share the responsibility for teaching through shared expertise and to share the physical structures that are schools. Technology has a role in these scenarios in trying to engage students in learning in ways that are much more relevant to them. The most extreme of the scenarios, we see the movement towards de-schooling, a movement which has quite a number of supporters. We see the demise of schools as we know them to be replaced by a range of other providers of formal education with government withdrawing from direct involvement in schools. We've seen this scenario play out in the vocational education sector in Victoria over the last four years where TAFE colleges have had their funding slashed and the money redirected towards private providers. 
but with not a particularly happy ending. At the moment, one of the biggest providers of vocational education is in under um, quite a cloud, as I think it's about less than 10% of its students end up graduating. Mm. But we're also seeing the rise of non-formal learning networks, a trend that's gaining momentum in the business sector, but which some observers believe has potential edu- application in the school sector. Examples could include the Khan Academy. Uh, check it out if you have not familiar with it, particularly the maths teachers amongst you. Online learning removed from school completely. Although recent moves in this arena suggest that Khan is looking to embed his academy in school curriculum in the United States rather than being separate from it. Doug Thomas and John Seeley Brown advocate a whole new culture of learning in a world of constant change that doesn't involve schools in their current form. Grounded in ideas of George Seaman, who's proposing a new theory of learning based on the notion of connectivism. Not things we really have time here and now to explore in depth, but if you're interested, there are some references I've added to the Workshop One folder on the course website for you to pursue. So... What do you think schools are for? Is schooling only to ever take place in formal collections of buildings and spaces we know as schools, taught only by people who are qualified and registered as teachers, or are there other possibilities? As a member of this profession in the early part of the 21st century, it's vital that you develop a view on this. Where do you sit? What role do you want to play in the evolution of schools? Examine what you think. I guess I tried to introduce a little bit of humour at this point by showing some memes. Um, But it raises the question of teacher you or real you. And where do you sit? What kind of teacher do you want to be? And the following memes probably typify some of the stereotypes that society holds about teachers. How do you respond to these memes? Do you want to be like these teachers? I suppose not. Have you had a great teacher and want to be just like them? Are there characteristics of a number of teachers you want to harness, mash up and emulate? One of the problems of asking you at this stage is that you probably don't know. You've had one experience of teaching, seen from the perspective of a student. But from this experience, you come to teaching with theories of what a teacher should be. You don't come without some sort of baggage about teaching or what a teacher is or should be or might be. In this course and in other courses, we ask you to examine those personal theories regularly in light of the new ideas and experiences you're exposed to in your teacher preparation program. Teaching is a highly complex profession, situated in highly complex places we call schools. Being a teacher involves many diverse responsibilities both in and beyond the classroom. Yes, you teach students the discipline you specialise in, but that is also complex as you have to deal with varying abilities and rates of progression in each of your classrooms. But schools today are so much more than teaching the discipline you specialise in or teaching the curriculum. So much happens in schools on a daily basis that goes beyond teaching the curriculum. Student welfare and well-being, dealing with parents, professional learning as a recipient and as a provider, extracurricular activities that are a rich part of the fabric of a school. What are your theories about these aspects of being a teacher? As an alternative to the stereotypes represented in those memes, I'd like you to um, watch this brief video by Bill Ayres, who is an excellent educator with some somewhat radical political views but his um, video represents another perspective and a far more positive perspective on teachers and it's well worth the view. There is a link to this also in the going further section of the workshop one on the course website. Again what kind of a teacher do you want to be? Lorty talks about us as teachers as being, especially beginning teachers, as the accretion of views, sentiments and implicit actions that are only partially perceived. One of the aims of this course is to help you perceive things that you may currently not be perceiving. 
So our course is centered around ideas that we want you to think about, be challenged by. And it's also centered around experience when you're in schools. And we want you to link the ideas and theories that we talk about here to the practices that you're observing when you're in those schools. And to use the combination of the ideas that we, represent, that we present to you, the practices that you observe, think about those, bring those together and think then about the kind of teacher you want to be.